to this. You're a 20 year old kid with a chip on your shoulder. You have a big <laughs> ego and yet you don't know it. And uh, you think you're the shit, but not really. And <laughs> you're going to start a fucking gym. There you are. One thing I'm constantly fascinated by is all the different career paths you can pursue within the fitness industry. When I was coming out of school, all the traditional paths were there, including becoming a personal trainer, strength coach, rehab professional, or even a dietitian. But as our understanding of health and wellness has grown, now you have sleep coaches, recovery specialists, and of course, sports scientists. And while it's definitely annoying to have a million new people out there who are claiming to be fitness influencers, I think there are some great people out there creating fitness content, including writers like last week's guest Steve Magnus and this week's guest and good friend Nate Green. While Nate started out like many of us as a coach and gym owner, he quickly realized that that wasn't where his true passion resided, so he dove headfirst into the world of fitness writing. Nate is currently the director of content strategy at Waking Up, an advanced meditation app with over 50,000 five-star reviews. Prior to that, he spent over a decade working behind the scenes at Precision Nutrition and other influential health and fitness companies. He's written for T Nation, Men's Health Magazine, and has been featured in the LA Times and Tim Ferriss' blog. Now, if you are regular to this show, welcome back. As always, love and appreciate you. And if you're new here, welcome. I'm Mike Robertson, and this is the Physical Preparation Podcast. In this show, we take deep dives into the art and science of coaching, queuing, program design, business, and personal development. Basically anything to help you become a better trainer, coach, or rehab pro. Now, as you'll recall, I wrote for a good portion of my professional career. I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that over the years, I've probably written well over 2,000 articles, blogs, and newsletters. In fact, my time at T Nation is probably the reason at least in some small part, that you're listening to this show as it gave me a platform to get my thoughts and ideas out into the world. And while we will talk about writing, perhaps more importantly in this show, we're going to talk about communication. Regardless of what your job title is or what segment of the fitness industry you reside in, we can all work to improve our communication skills. We talk about what led Nate to the world of writing and when he realized that training and coaching just weren't going to be his full-time gig. And last but not least, we talk about the evolution of Nate's training over the years, and when he moved from being your classic everyday meathead into something a little bit more well-rounded and refined. This episode was a ton of fun, and while the language is a little bit more colorful than usual, I really hope you'll enjoy our chat. Okay, so before we dive into this week's episode, I want to give you a quick recap of the week that was, a little insight as to what's new in my neck of the woods, and let's be honest, It's been a busy, busy couple of weeks. So for starters, July 27th, in case you didn't know this, is my birthday. So if you didn't know that, put it in your calendar. You can wish me a happy birthday next year. But yeah, turned 44, which is crazy to think about. And a lot of times people are like, oh my gosh, you're 40 or you're over 40. And, you know, I will generally respond with the fact that that's great. I don't feel like that's old. I don't feel old uh, most days unless I'm just terribly unrested (laughs) and slept very poorly. What makes me feel old more than anything is looking at my children here lately uh, because they look so old and mature and uh, they actually started school this week, which is crazy to think about as well. Uh, You know, just thinking about the fact that I have a sixth grader and a third grader. I mean, I feel like it was just yesterday. Kendall was six and now she's in sixth grade. So obviously just a lot going on over here between the birthday, between school starting, Uh, Last week, I traveled to beautiful Ames, Iowa to work with my guy George Yang for a couple days. Uh, George actually worked with me, geez, I think it was six or seven years ago now uh, when he was with the Pacers. Uh, So I got a month in with him then. Uh, I've worked with him and consulted with him off and on over the years, but actually got to go out to Ames for a couple days and work with him, just trying to make sure this guy is locked in and ready for the season. So it was great to catch up with him. Uh, as you can tell, traveled, so now I have a little bit of a head cold thanks to all the travel and being in airports and all that, but fighting that off and 
you know, beyond that, uh, beyond school starting, we also have fall sports cranking up as well. So Kendall uh, started soccer this week, a little bit more intensive program this year because she's going to actually practice three days a week. Still one game on the weekend, maybe a couple tournaments sprinkled in throughout the year, but really excited for her to kind of level up her development. Also kind of bittersweet thinking about the fact that I will not be coaching her anymore. You know, I've had so many great years coaching her, uh, whether it was soccer, whether it was in basketball, whether it was in softball. So a little bit bittersweet to think about, you know, the fact that maybe I won't get to coach her anymore, but also excited for her to be working with more professional coaches and coaches that know more about the game. Um, And so now I just get to be you know, kind of her biggest fan out there. So she's already had a couple practices. Uh, I, I like where she's at. I think she's going to have a, a really good year ahead of her, and I'm just excited to see her grow. So she's got that. Cade starts fall ball baseball this weekend, so excited to get him back out there. I mean, he just loves baseball right now. It's his absolute favorite sport. Uh, and I remember when I was growing up, I loved baseball as well. I was enamored with you know the drills and throwing and catching and hitting off tees and soft toss and you know I just absolutely loved it as well so excited for both of them lots going on hopefully they're going to sleep well this week with all the things that we have going on but yeah lots of great stuff going on here I hope you can say the same so you know without any further ado we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to jump into this awesome new episode with my guy Nate Green. It seems like every day I talk to a young trainer or coach who is frustrated. Maybe they're frustrated with the results they're getting. Maybe they're frustrated because they don't have trusted resources to learn from. And maybe they're frustrated because they simply don't have enough clients and wonder how long they'll be able to stay in the industry. So if that sounds anything like you, I've got something that I know will help. My Complete Coach Certification was created for trainers and coaches just like you who are serious about the results they get and who know that becoming a better coach can directly translate to a bigger bottom line. This certification is gonna take the last 20 years of my life's work and put it all into one massive course. In it, you'll learn how to use the R7 system to create seamless, integrated, and efficient programs for clients and athletes of all shapes and sizes. How to create the culture, environment, and relationships with everyone you train so you can get the absolute best results and the exact progressions, regressions, and coaching cues I use in the gym, from squatting and deadlifting to pressing and pulling and everything in between. Of course, there's a ton more that I cover, but that should give you a pretty good idea of what the cert is all about. Now here's the thing, spots for the certification will only open twice per year for a limited time only. To get on the insider's list, just head over to completecoachcertification.com. Again, CompleteCoachCertification.com, and then stay tuned for emails in the coming weeks. Thanks so much for your support, and I hope you'll pick up a copy of the Complete Coach Certification when it launches. Nate, man, thanks so much for coming on the show here today. Really, really excited to have you on and catch up a little bit. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, yeah, and... uh... Thanks for the invite, man. I, uh, we, we were talking before, and uh, it's been a couple of years since I've done any kind of interview or podcast, so I'm uh, okay. I'm uh, appropriately nervous right now. Yeah, which is funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's cool. So, uh, where do you want to start? I guess I could start at the beginning. I mean, you got to start at the beginning, right dude. Give us the full path, like eighteen-year-old right, Nate. Full path the abbreviated version because no one wants the full, full path. Okay. Um, okay. All right. So basically, yeah, like in, uh, in high school, I was a terrible student, uh, probably had ADHD. I've never been diagnosed, but I, mean, I guess it's fair to say I, I graduated with a 1.7 GPA. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Just, yeah. Very, very bad. But <laughs> for whatever reason, um, I got super into health and fitness at the time and I realized that, Oh, it's not that I can't pay attention. It's just that I wasn't interested in what the people, uh, the teachers at school were trying to teach me, but I got super interested in health, fitness, nutrition, uh, behavior, psychology, all of it. And so like right after high school, I had this experience where I really fell into, fell in love with going to the gym and, and working out. And I had this body transformation where I gained like 40 pounds, um, and was super proud of that. 
And then from there, I was like, ah, school seems to be kind of off reach for me just based on previous performance. And honestly, I don't do well in structured environments like that. Why, why don't I try to pursue this health and fitness thing a little bit? And uh, so I uh, worked hard, got my personal training certification, uh, started working at this club called The Wave in, uh, in Whitefish, Montana, where I, where I went to high school. And just so started training clients. I had no idea what I was doing. I had like a, I didn't, I didn't even have a good certification. I'm not going to throw anyone under the bus and tell you what certification I had, but let's just say <laughs> it was not, it was not, not it wasn't the gold the standard. Huh? It was not the gold standard. Um, That's fair. But yeah, but anyway, so I, I got into it, started training clients, realized I really uh, loved it. I loved connecting with people. I love thinking about the body. Uh, this turned into me, uh, a couple a couple of things happened around that time where the first one was I opened up my own personal training studio. So my own gym, uh, start, I found T nation, uh, testosterone nation for those that don't know back in the day, this was like the king maker of the health and fitness industry. It was like, where all the top people like, like Mr. Mike Robertson, uh, <laughs> Eric Cressy, John Berardi, Dave Tate, Jim Wendler, Joe DeFranco, Charles Staley, Charles Poliquin, like all the heavy hitters and all the up and comers were kind of on T Nation. And so I, uh, I, I found them and, and, and obviously your work and everyone else's and uh, just started to build connections with, with people that I respected. So I'd email, I mean, I probably emailed Mike uh, when I was 19, um, <laughs> emailed quite a few other people. So I had this track going on where I was, I thought I wanted to be a personal trainer, thought I wanted to own a gym. And then simultaneously, I, would al I was always interested in kind of the writing aspect or the journalist aspect. One of my early mentors was Lou Schuler, who was the former fitness director of Men's Health Magazine. And so there was a part of me that was kind of enjoying going this opposite way, which was uh, thinking about writing from a kind of a journalist point of view, but even more so from, a, I guess, from a, a coaching slash marketing point of view. And uh, so I had this gem. And after running it for a couple of years, it just became evident that like, I mean, I feel like I knew and know quite a bit, um, I guess. I, I know enough to not hurt myself too badly and to keep myself genuine, uh, generally healthy. But I'm not, I didn't have the passion that someone like, uh, like an Eric Otter would have uh, for really, or, or for getting into the fine details of, of movement and everything. And I just felt like at some point, because I was surrounding myself with, people such as yourself and other people that I just named, it was just evident to me that like, ah, these guys have something that I don't have, or I don't really care to build. And so I, I really, at that point, uh, decided to kind of go the other direction. And I, st I was still doing my own personal training. I, I started doing some online coaching, but I, I got into the position where I was like, I just want to write about this stuff and, and connect other people and be kind of a, a bridge or a connection between the experts and, and general population or, you know, introducing one expert to another and facilitating uh, work that way. And so it was right around that time. I think I was in my early 20s. I wrote a book. Um, holy yeah. shit, I wrote a book. <laughs> I was 23 <laughs> years old. I literally yeah. had no idea what I was doing. Um, my... Uh, but my uncredited co-author was, was Lou Schuler, who I mentioned earlier. And so he was really someone that, that helped me kind of get that started. And uh, yeah, I wrote a book in uh, 2008 when it came out. Oh my God, that was so long ago. I feel like a yeah. totally different person. <laughs> uh, and so it, it was cool. So basically in my early 20s, like I, I had a, a, a you know, semi-successful personal training practice that I decided to, to let go and to pursue the online and the writing thing. And then just because, uh, because of my connections and because of my kind of like uh, my early hustle, if you want to call it that, I just met some really influential people who gave me opportunities. And so I met, you know, the people behind T Nation. So I was an assistant editor at, at that online magazine for two years. Uh, at that same time, I was doing some freelance writing for like men's health and men's fitness and, and meeting people over there. And as it happened back in uh, 2010, uh, Dr. John Berardi, um, who is the co-founder of Precision Nutrition, I met him a couple of times at different events. And uh, but he read some of my articles on T Nation and it's like, hey, you know, we're trying to grow Precision Nutrition. Do you have any interest in coming and joining us? 
And so I actually spent about 10 years at PN uh, kind of behind the scenes. So writing a lot of articles, but also really helping to develop the whole content marketing strategy, uh, at least in the early days. Um, and that was a huge education for me. Sure. Uh, yeah. And then from there, um, I, I have my own blog and uh, kept up with that for a while. It's kind of fallen away, but um, I basically left PN two years ago because I accepted a new job where I'm now the director of content strategy at a meditation app called Waking Up. And so it's, uh, it's interesting. It's like the way that I got into health and fitness um, was the way that I got into meditation where I just fell into it and became absorbed, uh, almost unhealthily uh, absorbed in it. And I guess now what I'm doing in the, in the meditation space, if you want to call it that, is very similar. Like on in some level, I actually feel like I'm kind of at the beginning of my career again and mm. with all these new skills and uh, new connections. But uh, yeah, I fundamentally kind of feel like a beginner again, which is both fucking terrifying <laughs> and kind of liberating and cool too. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's the... There, there's the, the the broad stroke, but I'm sure we can fill in details. I probably skipped a bunch of stuff, but uh, that, that'll kind of give you the idea of like, you know, the last 15 years of my life or so. No, I love it. And that's why I wanted to really let you kind of go through that and explain all of the, the details and all the stops because you've had, I mean, hell, in your first like five years in the industry, you owned a gym and wrote a book and like, or, you know, like five to 10 years, yeah. you did what a lot of people set out to accomplish their entire career. So that's why I wanted you to go through all that. Now I want to go back to the beginning because a okay. lot of times people think, Oh, I want to be a coach. I want to be a trainer. You know, I want to own my own space. So let's go back to when you're how, how old were you when you opened your gym, like 19, 20 years old, something like that. Yeah. I, I, I didn't open the gym yet, but I was, I was training people at, at 19 and then I opened the gym when I was uh yeah, 2021, 20, somewhere around there. Okay. So talk to me about that. Talk to me about that process of, all right, I'm a trainer. Now I'm going to open a gym. Walk okay. me through your thought process uh, there. All right. Thought process. So picture <laughs> this. You're a 20-year-old kid with a chip on your shoulder. You have a big <laughs> ego, and yet you don't know it. And uh, you think you're the shit, but not really. And <laughs> you're going to start a fucking gym. There you are. Um, that was it, huh? It was a good, yeah, no, it was it, I'll say it this way. The gym was a, a beautiful learning experience for me because it de de definitively showed me what I didn't want to do. Um, and I had to go through that. that. That's really when I realized that the the kind of path that, that you have taken or other people that I really respect um, have taken just wasn't, it just wasn't for me. I had to go a different way um, and work with my own like abilities and, and, uh, and uh, interests. But yeah, the gym was interesting. So right after, right after working at the, at the club, the wave, I forget what I, I was, you know, you get a percentage if you work for a company like that. So I, right. I forget what percentage I was getting of my income and then it became apparent to me, well, I don't really like collecting a paycheck from someone. It would be cool to own my own thing. And so the, the actual first step, and not a lot of people know this, but the first step that I took is my parents owned a martial arts studio. And they only did classes in the evening, starting at like 4 p.m. And as a trainer, for me, at least, all of my clients were in the morning for the most part or early, early afternoon. Right. And so the first thing that I did is actually one of my clients, uh, is a great dude named Larry, who is a, a biz local business guy. He gave me a $5,000 loan, um, which was very generous of him. And I, I bought a, like a crappy power rack and some dumbbells and just some bands and some random stuff. And I moved everything into my parents' karate school and I paid them $200 a month to rent that from them. And then I took all of my clients from the, from the gym I was working at and then brought them over here. So suddenly, instead of making 30% or 40% or whatever I was making, I was making 100% and I only had a $200 a month overhead. Killing so it, man. killing it, I was killing it. And it, the, it, the best part was the, my parents, uh, martial arts studio was in like this kind of strip mall and there was like a movie theater really close. So I would like, I would watch like three movies a week. I would just like train <laughs> my clients. And then at like 2 PM I'd peace out and go watch a movie, like a, awesome. a matinee movie. It was like my favorite thing to do. Yeah. So 
And so that was really cool. And it's a good step. Uh, but then what happened, is, and this is what I was alluding to earlier and kind of jokingly about like, you know, this ego and chip on my shoulder, but I thought, okay, well, now I have this facility, but it's not really mine. Like I'm renting out space in my parents' facility. I need to get my own thing. And so I, I partnered up with this guy, um, another trainer and a friend of mine named Sam. And him and I actually started looking around for like a location. So we found a, a dope location um, in a new building and in a new part of town, the corner of downtown. Um, and we took out like, we, then we did all the things that you're not really supposed to do or that we now in retrospect, I wish I wouldn't have done. But like, you know, our overhead suddenly was like ridiculous. I mean, at least in those terms, I, now it'd be laughable how much, but it was like right. thousands of dollars per month, right? Right. And so suddenly I have this, this location and now I have to do more marketing. And uh, I don't know, I, I just, it was then, it was then when I realized I don't know if I have it in me because I don't, I don't know if I care enough to do all of this stuff because I don't know if I'm even that good at training people. Like, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm better than anyone locally, but right. when I'm, when I'm comparing my skills to, to the people that I know of, like the, you know, uh, use you, the Mike Robertsons of the world, then mm -hmm. I'm just like, ah, this isn't for me. And so it was right, right then that I had to make the decision to kind of the break and go a different direction. So the, the gym and that part of my life was a really beautiful learning experience for me. And I'm glad that it happened, but it definitely showed me the path that I didn't want to take. Yeah, that that's huge. And there's a couple of things that are interesting in there. Number one, and I've talked about this numerous times on the show over the years, but I think a lot of times if you came up when we did in the fitness industry, right, you weren't a real major player unless you opened your own gym. Right. Like you yes. could be the best trainer possible. Like you could go anywhere and be the best. But if you don't have your own gym, it's like yeah, you were absolutely. not you weren't credible. So I think part of that was the mindset at that point in time. But that's that's really interesting, too, because I was going to ask, like, was there a specific point? Like, I love these stories of, you know, I'm on the brink of should I be a trainer? Should I be a writer? Is there like one moment that pushed you over that edge? And it sounds like maybe owning that business was just like, hey, look, like I can be pretty good at this or I can be really good at this. All right. So a couple of things happened and one of them kind of came out of nowhere. So right around this time, um, yeah, the gym was one, but that so that would have been what, 2006, 2007 ish around okay. that. Yeah. So something else happened around that time and you won't know it until I say it but a, a very important and popular book came out that just fucked everyone's world up in, in, in terms of people and, you know, in this age group or the certain industries. And that was the four hour work week. Oh yeah. And so, <laughs> yeah. So when the four hour work week by Tim Ferriss came out, I remember reading that in like 2007 and 2008. And it just, at that point, you know, I'm in my very early twenties. I not only do I have this like kind of I have this brick and mortar location, this gym that like on paper feel like looks good. I mean, on paper, it's financially not doing well because like, my overhead's so high. Right. Um, but it, but it looks good. And then here's this this guy, Tim Ferriss, talking about you know if you get away from the actual title, I mean, whatever, working four hours a week, maybe maybe not. But here's a guy talking about lifestyle design. And, you know, as, as, a, as a guy in my early 20s, that was like, what the fuck? I need to do that. Like, <laughs> and, and already I had found T Nation and I was getting, I, I don't even know if you know this, Mike, but uh, before I became an editor at T Nation, I was a moderator on their forums, Fridays and Saturday nights from 6 p.m. till midnight was my shift. So I basically forewent like, uh, I don't know if four went's a word. I just said it, but yeah, like, yeah. I, I did not, I did not have a Friday and Saturday night for a couple of years. Cause I was getting paid $12 an hour to be on a bodybuilding forum. Oh my gosh. And I get I free supplements that. every month. Yeah. yeah. It was amazing. And so with that, and then with my, my brief experience of like, Oh, there's a way, like I had a blog, my, my friend, Jason Langstorff, who I know, you know, yeah. um, my, uh, my best friend growing up and we're still close to this day, but uh, he was a web developer. And so it's, it's actually weird, man. It's, uh, now that I'm thinking about it, it's kind of coming back. He built my first website and for me and, and it was total shit. It looked like garbage, but it was great for the time. Yeah. In like 2006. 
And so I have a web presence, right? And so I, I feel like it was, that's pretty early, 2006, 2007, oh, yeah. 2008 for having a web presence. And so this whole new world opened up to me and it was, oh, maybe I could live wherever I wanted to work on the things that are really interesting to me, like writing and fitness, like combining those and, and marketing eventually and psychology kit came into it too. Um, it was just a really fertile, beautiful time because like everything, I was in my early twenties, the traditional path didn't work. And now here was this opportunity to kind of like make something new that had never existed before and, and, and try to like find a way to live a different kind of life. And so that, so owning the gym and then all of that kind of happening in the periphery where yeah. that's what really kind of sent me over the edge. I love it. That is so cool. Okay. So I think what's really interesting here isn't just that you pivoted into something new, right? But how you did that. So what mm -hmm. I'd love to hear about is, you know, when you're going into this, Obviously, you had some background in writing or something, or maybe you just have that innate talent. I don't know. But for the people that are listening in, how did you go about cultivating or developing that skill, which was in your case writing, that allowed you to work in the fitness industry, but maybe not in the traditional sense that most of us would think of? Yeah, um, good question. I guess I can only speak from my experience, right? So I'll tell you what I did, and then I, maybe there's maybe there are lessons to extrapolate from that. Hopefully there yeah, are. Yeah, of course. Not. But um, so writing, <laughs> all right, I'll, I'm going to drop another one on you. This is just fun. Like yeah. uh, as, as I'm thinking about this new stuff is like just memories is, are coming back. Yeah. So I got into writing because I was really into hip hop. Like I love okay. rap music. Okay. Yeah. And so again, think about the time I'm in high school. Uh, I graduated in uh, 2003 from high school. Um, so what, what became, what album became really popular? And when I was in high school, Eminem blew up, dude. Oh yeah. And so Eminem was on the scene and I remember because, you know, it's still early days of the internet and I'm like, I'm on T nation forums. I was on the Eminem fan forums. Okay. Now, this is where this, this is where this is going to connect. This is a, okay. it's a weird, it's a weird segue, but, uh, on the Eminem fan forum, you know, like freestyling, people will freestyle yeah, come of up course. with rhymes off the top of their head. So I used to key style, which means you would just write raps like spontaneously <laughs> on the computer and you would fucking battle people in like, the comment <laughs> section of the Eminem <laughs> fan forum. That's so awesome. I'm in, I'm in high school, freestyle, key styling. And then, you know, I have some girlfriends and I'm dating around. So I'm writing love notes. So that's, it's, it's that kind of just weird, uh, confluence of factors that like spawned my interest in writing and then i used to be a really big reader um like family grew up fairly poor so we just went to the library a lot read a lot of books played a lot of board games and so I, i'd always loved words and, and reading so i guess that's that's where it came from but then i mean to answer your question more specifically like getting away from from just those factors that maybe people can't relate to uh because you know it's unique to to me i guess and and everyone's got their own unique story but what happened is at t nation i uh i, I wrote uh tc uh who is who's the editor at the time maybe mm -hmm. still is the editor i don't know i just wrote him an email and i just tried to make it the best fucking email i've ever written and i tried to make it kind of literary right i don't know it was just good writing in an email and uh he gave me a shot to write an article um and what ended up happening is over the course of two years of me being there, I think I wrote over a hundred or more articles. And so I didn't have like a skill set per se. I had an, a, I had an interest in the subject matter, which was health and fitness and nutrition and all related topics, self-improvement or development, if you want to call it that. I had this innate love of, of reading and words and wordplay from from reading as a kid and then from like, you know, feminine rapping on the you know, key styling or whatever. <laughs> right. And, uh, and then I had just had a lot of work to do. I just put in a lot of reps. Like this is what people will tell you, right. Just got to do the work. I mean, you don't learn. You, nothing is a faster teacher than doing the thing that you say that you want to do. Like if you say you want to be a writer, I, I did want to be a writer. And how did I, 
practice that, I fucking wrote a lot of things. And yeah. the only reason I wrote them is because I had to, meaning, I mean, ultimately I didn't have to, cause I didn't have to work there. I didn't have to do any of it. But like, what I mean is I had an editor and I was on a deadline and I was passionate about what I was writing about. And so I just put in a lot of reps at T nation pretty early. And at that same time I started writing my blog um, cause my buddy, you know, built me this website. So now I'm connecting with people. I mean, I'm sure you still get this. Uh, I, I get it less and less now that I'm not as, as prominent as I, as I used to be. I, I haven't really been out there. I'm not on social media really or anything, but um. I remember getting emails from, from people who read my stuff and I was like, Holy shit. Like I re I write something and then people read it and it, and it affects them in some way, right. whether positive or negative. That's insane that I have that, that this exists, that the, the, this capability. And so that became this kind of like flywheel, this self-perpetuating thing where I'm like, I'm getting feedback on what I'm doing and it's good or it's bad, or it can be improved. And uh, that just, uh, that really helped the transition from writing too. So I guess what I'm saying is it was kind of a spontaneous, I, I knew I didn't want to be coaching people directly because I just wasn't that good at it and nor did I really have the interest to get better at it. And yet writing was just the one thing, the writing and the connecting and the, and the strategy behind it all um, and, the, and the connection behind it all. It just captivated my attention long enough where I had to, where I got into it and just started doing a lot of the work and the work you know, was shitty to start and then got better over time. And now I would say it's probably still mostly kind of shitty at the start and uh, it gets better over time, but now it happens in the same hour, not over the course of a year, which is nice. Right. Well, I can tell you, I remember when you were writing articles and as you started to get better, because I obviously not just wrote for T Nation, but read everything on T Nation back at that point in time. And I remember as you started writing and I was like, like, wow, like this dude can really write a good article because, you know, a lot of us at that point in time were coaches who also wrote, you know yes. what I mean? And there's a difference yeah, between totally. a writer that knows fitness and then writes articles about fitness versus a coach that coaches and then also writes fitness articles. So I yes. knew I could see the evolution. And I remember one article that stood out. Uh, did you go train with Joe DeFranco? For a little while, and then yeah, try and do like a forty. Oh God! They all the all all the yeah. So I I forget what year this was. Maybe two thousand ten. Yeah, I flew out to Jersey. Me and my buddy, me and Jason, uh, okay. he had a little he had a little camera that he took with him, so we filmed it. And uh, okay. yeah, I went out went out to DeFranco's, and I I basically was there for like kind of the 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 training camp or or the sessions right before the uh, NFL Combine, and so you had all these like top prospects from around the around the country and then some old pros that were coming in who were like unsigned free agents we're gonna you yeah. know looking for it to, to work out for a new team or whatever and hopefully get signed so I, I went in there and uh yeah man it was great I uh I, I'll say this I I held my own when it came to the to the weightlifting the 225 bench press test I crushed uh I think I got 22 reps which was insane I can't, I couldn't even imagine lifting that now, but the 40 yard dash, I remember setting up on the line to do it. And I'd never like, I mean, I've ran before I've done sprints before, but I've never like set up. And I had like five big dudes behind me just laughing their asses off at my <laughs> terrible setup. Cause, cause, cause Joe wouldn't coach me. He's like, let me just see you run it without any coaching first. And so right. it was just a mess. That's so funny, but I'm going to link to that article. I'm going to find it and I'm going to link to it if I can, because I want people to see like when you wrote that article though, Hey, we can laugh about it now. But like, that's when I was like, okay, this dude's writing game is really like starting to come around. Like it was just really well-written. It was engaging. And I was like, okay, there's another level. Oh, to this, great. And I am not there yet. Um, yeah. Thanks dude. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. Yeah. So I'm a big believer that communication is there's an art to it. There's a science to it, but I'm also a believer that like direct communication, being clear and concise is a very lost art form these days. So yeah. what advice would you give to fitness professionals, right? Coaches, trainers, rehab professionals to help them communicate more clearly, whether it's an email, something they're shooting for social media, anything. Yeah. I 
All right. I think this would apply to any, any situation. Um, I find it helpful. I don't, I don't always do this, but when I, do, when, when I do do what I'm about to describe, it does make everything a little bit easier and, and, and much clearer. And so at the top of a, a document, like a Word document or a piece of paper or whatever, whatever you're writing on, before you start, write down, what am I trying to say? Just what am I trying to say? And then the, your whole time is spent kind of figuring that out as it happens in practice, right? Like, you yeah. know, they're going to be false starts. You don't want to try to get it perfect immediately, but you just keep coming around. Like, what am I actually trying to communicate here? What's the point I'm trying to make? What, why is this important to the person that I'm speaking to? Um, what do I want from it? What do I need from it? So there are all these kind of like sub questions underneath what am I trying to say, but really it's just, it's starting off the, the writing or the communication with just ultimate clarity and, and then once you, and then whatever it is you write, a social media post, an email, um, a script, an article, whatever, whatever it is, once you've kind of figured out what it is you wanted to say, the next, the, the, I guess the last question to ask is, have I said it? And is there anything extra here? And so then that's the editing process. So the editing process is going back and going, okay, well, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say this. Well, have I said it in this article or in this social media post? Well, yes, kind of, but I distracted from it because I, you know, put these things in or no, I'm not, it wasn't actually as clear as I, as I could make it. And so that's, that's just simple advice that I think anyone could use. Like start off anything with what am I trying to say? And then when you think you've said it, ask yourself the question, have I actually said it? Yeah, that's fantastic advice honestly, because so many times, and I find this a lot with questions, like people will, I'll say, well, do you have any questions? And then like five minutes later, they're still going. And I'm like, okay, stop. Is there a question in there? Right? Yes. Like they don't really know what they're trying to say. And it's the same thing here, right? Like be really clear yes. on the objective and what you're trying to say, uh, and then go from there. And and one of the other yeah. things that that I always liked since we're kind of talking about writing and communication and that sort of thing, I find a lot of times people have trouble getting started and not that this is life mm. advice. I think Ernest Hemingway said something along these lines. You can correct me if I'm wrong, cause you probably know, but it was something along the lines of write drunk and edit sober. Did you yeah. ever hear that? <laughs> I did. I don't know. I, I don't know if he actually said it. Maybe he did. I, I don't know if he said it, but the point being, so often we're worried about like our first draft and you know, yes. as well as I do, like I would never, ever, 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 when I was writing fitness content, let somebody see my first draft because it's so bad. Totally. You know, you know what I mean? It's like, I'll, I'll get stuck and I'll just type more here in caps or I'll be like, yes, typing and I'll exactly. be like all caps, this is effing awful, you know, on and on. It's like, Hey, like the concepts are here. I'm just trying to get it out of my head and get it started. And then the second draft, the third draft, the edits, right. that's what really yes. brings it together, you know? Yeah. All right. So let's talk about that for a minute, because I, I find the same thing, even after all these years. And I, I'm not going to say that I'm like a, a great, great writer in any way, but I've done some things that I'm proud of and I've tried to write the shit out of them. And so I, for, for me, I still have really shitty first drafts. In fact, it, it, it not only it's not a value judgment. That's just what it is. I just yeah. know it when I come, when I go into it, like a precision nutrition, we always used to say like, well, let's just get a shitty first draft done. And the shitty first draft, SFD, just get an SF, just get an SFD. Yeah. So the shitty first draft we just knew was going to be the seed of an idea. It was, it was going to be the, the process of going through it and starting is the most worthwhile it's the most energy zapping but most most worthwhile thing you can do is to actually start it because it's going to be crap and it's, it's yeah. not even going to be the ideas aren't going to be fully formed it's not going to be beautifully written um it's not going to be captivating i mean maybe certain parts of it are um but yeah shitty first draft just think about writing that first whatever you like you said like you know you put in all caps more info here I do the exact same thing. It's like keeping the muscle going. It's like 
It's like, even if you're not saying what you want to say, keep your fingers moving yeah. and then sit on it for like a day or two, if you yeah. can, or more. And it's always, always easier to come back to something that already exists and to prune it and to edit it and to, and to move things around and to elaborate and to cut. It's much easier to do that than it is to start something. So it's really it's really two specific phases. And I think they're distinct phases that, uh, yeah, to, to pay attention to those and to know that you're not a failure if you, if it, you find it hard to write or if, it, or if, you know, you think your first draft is shitty because everyone's first draft is shitty. Yes. I love it, man. Even Hemingway. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Okay. So another topic that I want to dive into here is the evolution in your own training as well, because mm. again, I kind of remembered, you know, I write, pro I wrote programs for you at one point, yep. you know, you're doing the Joe DeFranco combine prep stuff. So I know it may be hard, but can you take us in the way back machine 15, 20 years ago and describe kind of what your training philosophy was when you got started? Uh, don't do any cardio or conditioning, um, <laughs> do a bunch of, do a bunch of heavy lifting and don't stretch because, uh, you're going to mess up your, uh, muscle firing patterns. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to 2008, my friends. I mean, that's where we were. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, this is the, the good thing too, right? Like it, uh, because I found T nation when I found it, when I was like in high school, you say what you want about the content. It was, it was probably the best, some of the best you could find anywhere on the internet in terms of like actual science backed, like cutting edge. This is what people are finding. And they're, you know, real coaches are writing this stuff in the trenches. So they know what's up. And so, I mean, the first programs that I actually ever did were like total body training, like, you know, two or three workouts a week or four workouts a week, upper, lower split, um, main focus on, deadlift squats presses pulls all that so I, I had the kind of the fundamentals from that perspective um and so that's really where where the training really kind of started in earnest and i gained all that muscle um and then you know over time you learn new things and so uh, as you would hope to and from there i uh i remember when i moved to portland uh, this was i probably spent i probably spent a decade uh, or, or at least eight, eight solid years in that kind of like, not really bodybuilding, not really athleticism, but kind of an in-between of just yeah. like, you know, total body stuff, upper, lower splits, whatever, lifting weights. That was it. I lifted weights. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, and, and then it wasn't until like, I don't know, maybe eight years ago now where I'm like, oh, maybe movement is important. Like I remember when you and you and Cressy did magnificent mobility and I was like, oh yeah, like, all right, maybe I got to start doing something like this. But then it was still just something that was like, you only did it at the beginning of a workout, right? right and right. so I do it at the beginning of a workout for like five, 10 minutes. And I'm like, fuck it. I don't like this stuff. Now I'm going <laughs> to go lift some heavy shit. Right. And so, yeah, that was the, that was the paradigm for me. And uh, things really, it got me to a certain point. I'm actually really happy about it on some level because I felt like I developed a base of strength and of, of muscle mass that like, I kind of always have it now. Like it yes. feels like it's there. It doesn't really go away. Like I can, you know, I'll lose some weight if I don't eat as much for a while. I'm kind of like a natural kind of skinny, slight, like mesomorphic, but kind of lean toward the skinny side of things. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll lose some weight pretty quickly. Um, but the strength and all that's always there. Um, but where it was harmful, or I guess just the, you know, the, the inverse of that was that I, because I didn't fucking stretch and because I didn't have any conditioning, I wasn't actually in shape. I just looked like I was. Right. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe that's why I, my book was called built for show. So apparently that's a <laughs> full circle built for yeah. show, but I couldn't do anything. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, so, so where are you at now though? Right. Because I can yeah. see where this is going. So talk to me about the yeah. evolution. All right. So now I would say I, so we have a little basement gym downstairs, nothing fancy, but um, we have some kettlebells down there. I have a rowing machine, um, uh, have some rings hanging up. So I would say a couple times, a couple times a week now I'm down there 
just doing like density stuff. So just lots of kettlebell swings and get ups and, and presses. Um, a lot of like, I guess what people would call like animal based movements and flows. So just kind of what you and Cressy were doing with magnificent mobility, but then like the mo- the modern version of it, right? Like sure. bear crawls and crab walks and just, and, and kind of, it's almost like a free flowing dance, if you will, on some level, like a movement dance. Yep. So a lot of that, um, more conditioning. So aside from just like the actual hiking, I, I, I met Joel Jameson years ago, helped him with some projects. And so I got really into his work and like training with a heart rate monitor. So just doing, um, you know, high resistance intervals and, and road work, just like longer duration, longer duration cardio. And I'm still in the gym. I say I get in there solidly twice a week to, to still lift stuff. But now it's weird, man. Like I, there's just some movements I don't do anymore. Like I don't really, I don't really bench press uh, with the barbell anymore. I don't really do any back squats or even really any super heavy deadlifts. I'm doing like a lot of single leg work, um, a lot of, uh, a lot of rowing, a lot of, uh, I don't know, just, just still big basic movements, presses and things, but I don't know. I feel, I feel healthier than I've felt in a long time. Yeah. And, uh, and also, I, I mean, you'll, you'll appreciate this. I found a really great PRI guy locally here. So I got like the mouthpiece and everything that's been super helpful. And, uh, just seeing how I'm kind of always on my right. I'm never in my left hip. So just yeah. getting more aware of just, of just movement patterns in general and, and ways that I'm sitting and standing and moving throughout the day that, you know, are, are counterproductive and, and making me tight and sore. So yeah, it's really, I, I still have the, the seed of knowledge. Like I felt like I, I felt like in 2008, I was doing the best stuff you could do in 2008. And yeah. now I feel like I'm still, I still kind of, I mean, not like most people listening to this podcast because I'm just not in that world anymore. But as a as a layman on the outskirts now, I'm like I know enough to hang, and so I'm, yeah. I know enough to hang. That's cool. That's man. Where I'm at. That's cool. I love it. Okay, so I want to kind of bring this full circle because as we go through your career path, right, you've worked with like major players basically at every stop in the fitness industry, right? So like if we walk through this, okay, we got T Nation for training precision nutrition for nutrition, yep. waking up now, meditation, Joel yep. talks about stress, uh, mindset, recovery, conditioning. I mean, that's, that's quite a lineup there that you've been influenced by, right? And that yes. you've, you've had to take these deep dives into. And I know you're also like always thinking, right? Which is what I love about you. You're always thinking, you're always contemplating and putting these pieces together. So how have you taken all of this and like since of uh, and synthesized yeah. it right it's a good in, word into this like overarching life and body philosophy Woo. it's a big one right a big question yeah, yeah. No, it's good I'll, I'll say this without getting too woo woo and out there um more and more my experience is one of engaged rest um Meaning, I'm really thankful for my earlier self in my 20s and all, and, and all the people that, that kind of helped me get to where I was um, back then. And uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunities that I had um, to, to write, a, you know, write a book and work with you know, cool people in the industry. And, and, and I got to meet a lot of, you know, semi-famous or actually famous people like internet famous people too and i just kind of get to see behind the scenes of 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 all these different industries and so i know like and i know a lot of people too i can see who's who's feels as if they're doing really good work in the world and is in a good place and people that you know maybe don't feel that way and yet they have these um these brands of these personas. Um, and, and I just know like underneath there's like some deeper things going on that are, that are challenging for them that they, they can't really share. And so I, I, I say all of that because more and more, I'm just coming from this place of gratitude where I'm like, Holy shit. I'm glad that all this stuff happened. And yet none of it, all of it has been beautiful and has changed me, but none of it has saved me. Meaning mm. I don't think that there's nothing. I don't think there's anything I can do that's going to make my life better than it already is. And I don't mean that because I make, I like, 
God, I wish I would have saved more money when I was in my twenties. My, my <laughs> right. God, why didn't, why didn't you or someone come and fucking slap me and tell me to save money? <laughs> Um, right <laughs> so i mean things i mean th- th- things are good now and, and all that but like so I'm, I'm not saying i'm like i don't have like a ton of money but what i do have is like what, what was really important for me it was kind of building in this level of freedom um to kind of you know to record a podcast with you on a thursday at noon or whatever and to be able to control my own schedule um but there's just this this gratitude that like i don't know i don't really like I am always thinking about things and I am always like kind of contemplating things, but there's less and less of a, there's less and less of a goal now. And there's, and, and I'm, and I'm not convinced that anything that I'm going to do, any decision that I'm going to make is fundamentally going to change what I am. And, mm-hmm. and that's actually a really good thing. Like uh, the, there's no more, there's very little interest in self-improvement and self-development now. Not to say that it's not there. Like I want to be the best husband I can be for my wife. I want to be a better listener for my colleagues. I want to be a better writer. I want to, you know, take care of myself. So there's all these things that I still want to do and I think are important. So I, I guess you could call those goals, but I'm just kind of comfortable being me now. And that's yeah. the, I don't know. It, does, it doesn't feel like, Cause I know what it gets you. Like I, I, you can write a book and it could change your life or you could write a book and you're still the same fucking person and, right. and that's okay. So I'm just, that's where I'm at right now with, with everything is like, you know what? I feel pretty fortunate to be alive and to have had the experiences that, that I've had. And, to, you know, for my, for the luck of the draw of like where I was born, when I was born, who I was born, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and so more and more, I'm just like, I don't know. Things are kind of weird everywhere in the world, but life is pretty fucking sacred and beautiful too. And uh, it just feels good to, again, without sounding woo, to kind of honor that, right? To like, yeah. And so in my in my movement practice, like I, I try not to wear headphones as much and as often, and just to kind of connect with my breathing and kind of like almost like people in yoga would do, right? Like, yeah. Just be more present, be more aware. Same thing when I'm eating food, when I'm with my wife, when I'm here with you when I'm trying to do my work, like I have all these moments of confusion and anger and, and all this and striving and jealousy and all this stuff still comes up for me. And yet I know on some level that there's no ex- escaping from it. And so it's like, I've kind of, like I said, in, engaged rest. I've just kind of settled back into, I don't know what the fuck's going to happen next, but whatever happens, I think will be okay. Wow. That- that is a really cool answer, dude. I love it. I love it. Okay. So as if that wasn't a big question, now I've got the real big question. Okay. If you could alter the space-time continuum and give young yes. Nate Green one piece of advice, what's it going to be? Save 20% of your gross income into oh my uh, gosh. Right? Uh, Van- uh, Vanguard index funds. Right. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah, dude. That's the one piece of advice that and that and uh, and no one cares. I mean, they care mm. as it as it relates to how your actions affect them. But like, I don't know. I was pretty pretty concerned what other people thought of me, and like, no one really cares. Like, and, and not that they don't care in a negative way. It's just that no one's really paying attention to you. They're all paying attention to themselves. Yes, and, yes. And so to, to not take yourself so seriously. Yeah, there's some some analogy that I'm not even going to try and recite because I know I would butcher it. But it's something along those lines, right? Like when you're in your 20s, you're so absorbed and you think everybody's thinking about you. And in your 40s, yeah. you're like, oh, I don't think people care. And by the time you're like 60, you realize like, no, they don't care at all because they're worried about themselves. You know, yeah. but it takes you sometimes 30, 40 years to figure that out versus just no, everybody's dealing with their own stuff. They're not worried and they're not thinking about you. And again, like you said, not in a negative way. It's just, that's the realist yeah. or that's, it's just, that's reality. When you think about it, when you think about it, are you, you thinking about any of them? Probably not as only, as only as it relates to you and how they affect you or their behavior. Right. So like, yes. yeah, not to negate, not to negate the fact that, you know, yes, it, it is important to show up and, and all that, but like, it's not, just don't take yourself too seriously. And if you can learn that I'm 37 now, so. God, I hope I can learn it now because I don't want to wait until I'm 60 to, yes. to do that. Yes. All right, man. Last but not least, lightning round. So four fairly short questions. Your answer okay. can be as long or short as you like. Number one, I hate this. 
but I'm going to ask anyway. Is there okay. like one career highlight for you? Like one thing where you're like, that was a huge moment for me. Yeah. Um, in 2018, I went on a backpacking trip in Yellowstone with 20 other guys. And I wrote about the experience for Men's Health. And it was a, a feature piece. So it was like a 3,500 word article oh my. Um, about the about men's groups and kind of like the men's kind of like mental health crisis and how that affects uh, women in the world. And so I wrote this article um, yeah, a couple of years ago and uh, it was the hardest thing I've ever written, like from a skill standpoint okay. um, and the subject matter I, it was really close to my heart and, and still is. Uh, yeah, it was, it was an article. Um, I'm not sure what it's called online anymore, but um, it was called There Will Be Tears. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's that right there. That, that, was the, that was the culmination of me. Like it was for a, a major magazine. It was a feature piece. And I tried to write it as if it, would, it, it could live in the New Yorker or the Atlantic or Esquire magazine. Like Men's Health is a great publication. Um, they have some great writing in there. And, and, and that, especially now, um, it's even more kind of literary, but I tried to write the shit out of that article and I feel like I did a good job. So I love it, man. I'll try and find it and link it. Cause I, I want to read that too. Okay. Number yeah. two, you lived literally all over the world for an entire yeah. year. Did you have a favorite spot? Yeah. If I could go back anywhere, I would spend a few months every year in, uh, in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Um, God, I just love the food. I love the culture. It was like, Buddhist Buddhist monasteries everywhere. Yeah, uh, it's just like a, it really got a peaceful quality to it. At the same time, it's like a like a small city in the north, so it is just like the hustle and bustle of, of people living their lives. And uh, yeah, so I I would say Thailand, and then uh, go off to the beaches every now and then too. I love it. Okay, number three, best and worst part of growing up in Whitefish. <laughs> uh, Best part was um, access to nature. Just, yeah. just. I mean, you're in nature. You can't. I mean, it's in the middle of nowhere in Montana, <laughs> right? I mean, right. not nowhere, but it's like you know, it's, you're in the fucking woods, pretty much. Um, <laughs> and and in Glacier National Park, for mo- most of my childhood, it was like my backyard. It was a 25 minute drive away, and so I just spent so many times, countless, countless hours. Um, hiking in nature with mountains and, and rivers and, and being under the stars. So that was, that was huge, huge for me. I'm so grateful for my parents for, for moving us there. Worst part, you're in fucking Whitefish, Montana, man. You don't know nothing. <laughs> you guys, there's no good. I mean, it's getting, it's getting better now, but like, you know, I didn't have Thai food till I was 15. Right. <laughs> didn't even yeah. know that existed. Yeah. Although I have had sushi. so many. I know, and I know you put instilled this in me, but man, I've had so many people talk to me about Montana and how beautiful it is. So someday, yeah. man, I'm uh, going to get there. Yeah, it's why I'm still here. It's uh, yeah, I, I love it here. I, I'll say this. Um, I'm really grateful that my lifestyle has afforded me the ability to like live here most of the time. And then every now and then I get to travel to a city or to a new place. So I get my kind of my big city fix. I can go to museums. I can go to Broadway shows. I can go great, get, you know, great, great food wherever. Um, but then I get to come back to my, to my little place here. That's nice. Yeah, I love it, man. Okay. Last but not least, number four, what's next for All Nate right. Green, man? <laughs> oh, I would have had a lot of answers to that question. Um, a few years ago. Now I, I really don't know. I'll say, what I'm doing is I'm waking up every day and I'm seeing what's what I have to do, which is get up, help my wife, uh, get ready for work. Um, and then I sit down on my desk after I meditate and, and do a little training session. And I just try to make my work the best I can possibly make it. And so we're trying to grow waking up right now. I mean, it's, we have, we have, uh, a really large member base. Um, it's super rewarding work. I feel like it's on the, it, it's, it's, it's a semi, I guess you call it like a semi advanced meditation app. Um, 
so it's just it's a really rewarding place to work and i feel like we're doing really good work in the world and uh yeah so and what's next for me is just continuing to show up every day and, and to try to grow grow that company and to stay close to the to the truths and the and the knowledge and the and the wisdom that we're trying to to share not not from ourselves but from other scientists and philosophers and meditation teachers we're kind of bringing all these people together and uh creating this this habitat or this this uh wise companion that you can carry around that can help you get through life uh and and see life for what it is which is kind of just a, a weird fucking crazy <laughs> terrible beautiful mystery yes wow I, you you must <laughs> fit in so well there. over there dude <laughs> You have to fit in so well, man. I love it. Well, uh, Nate, no, dude. Hope, hope I'm not too woo-woo for your audience. Not at all, man. Not at all. Man, it's been so great <laughs> catching up with you today. So great seeing your face. Where can my listeners find out more about you and the great work that you're doing? Yeah, I I have my website, but I mean, I don't do anything with it right now. So if people really want to look it up, they can just Google my name and, and find it. Um, but I would just turn everyone to wakingup.com and uh, you can take a free trial. And uh, I don't know, meditation, just like fitness. When, when I discovered T Nation and, and Mike Robertson and, and all these other people changed my life. And I, uh, when I discovered uh, meditation um, and, and some of the teachers that, and, and philosophers and scholars that are on this app, it changed my life in a different way and kind of started me on a whole new, I guess, a whole new season of life. And so, yeah, I just encourage people to check that out. I think that I think they'd get something from it. And if not, no hard feelings. Right. Right. I love it, man. Thank you again, Nate, so much for your time. This was really, really great catching up. Yeah. Thank you, man. All right, my friend, that does it for this week's episode with Nate Green. Really hope you enjoyed it. I mean, he's just so much fun to catch up with. Nate and I have been friends for, geez, I don't know, like closing in on 20 years now. I feel like I think I first met Nate in 2006 or so at the Washington DC test fest and you know worked with him in all kinds of different ways whether it was I think some online programming back in the day whether it was working with him at T Nation and having him help me with articles and editing articles and just helping me to continue to grow and evolve as a writer so lots of fond memories with him and just really cool to see his evolution over the years and see some of the things that he's done like some of these major major like fitness groups, right? When you're talking about precision nutrition, you're talking about waking up. For him to make a massive impact with those companies is really a testament to the hard work that he's put in. So really hope you enjoyed the show. Hope you learned a thing or two. If you did, please do me one favor. If you haven't already, go to wherever you consume podcasts and subscribe right now today iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, Google Play, the Amazon Store, wherever you consume podcasts. Go there right now, hit the subscribe button so you know each and every week when a new episode drops. All right, my friend, that does it. Again, thank you so much for your support. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back next week with our next episode. Take care.